Hello and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Amata, where as always I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today we're going to kick off proceedings with an announcement from AMD regarding the Radeon Pro W5700. So, as I mentioned, this has been officially announced by AMD and as the name heavily suggests, this is the Pro variant, the workstation variant of the RX 5700, which we are much more familiar. And it has a lot of similarities with that particular graphics card. Cards. It has the same feature set, but of course it has drivers optimized for design workflows. And we do see changes again mostly on the software side, but let's talk about the specifications, even though again this is very similar to the consumer level card. We see 36 compute units, so we are seeing 2304 stream processors and 64 raster operation units on Navi 10 of course. And we see a clock speed, a max clock speed, sorry, should I say, of 1930 MHz, bringing 8.89 TFLOPs to the table, as well as, of course, 8 gigs of GDDR6 across a 256 interface. So what about performance, I hear you ask? Well, AMD themselves have said that compared to their GCN-based cards, it delivers a 41% higher performance per watt. And in their official slides, which you have undoubtedly been seeing on screen this whole topic, they compared the card against the Radeon WX8200, um, which is a Vega-based offering with more stream processors, HBM, and around 11 TFLOPs of compute performance. But we do see in the performance slides that they have provided that the Radeon Pro W5700 is ahead versus its predecessor. So they have, of course, shown an official trailer which will be linked in the description below which also has been playing in this particular video but they've also said that the key features are obviously the RDNA architecture which we are very familiar with we've got power efficiency as it's 18 percent better system efficiency than the competitive products we see the accelerated CPU and GPU multitasking obviously the professional grade software which again is this where this card really differentiates itself from the consumer level card we've got some VR features as well obviously PCIe 4 and USB-C as well. But let's move on, shall we, to Intel. So what we have next up is some benchmarks that have surfaced for Intel on their next-gen Comet Lake S 10-core and 6-core CPUs. Now I just wanted to say a quick credit to Tom's Hardware for this topic. They are the ones who have posted these benchmarks, so a big thank you to them. But what we have is some Geekbench results for both these uh, processors. So let's start off with the lower end, shall we, with the 6-core parts. So let's start off, shall we, with the results, which as you can see are a single-core score of 3667 and a multi-core score of 15843. In terms of specifications, we see 6 cores and 12 threads being shown here, and a base frequency of 1.99 GHz, and of course a maximum frequency of 2.89. We can also see information, however, on the cache. So we see 384 kilobytes of L1 instruction and data caches, so 32 KB times 6, 256 KB of L2 cache, and 12 megs of L3. But the one you're all really interested in, I know, is the 10 core part. Um, and as you can see, it has a single core score of 4074 and a multi core score of 25962. As for the specifications, as you can see, it is significantly better than the one we just looked at 10 cores and 20 threads um, being shown here. Base frequency of 1.51 GHz and a maximum frequency of 3.19. And again, we can see cache information, so we see 32 KB each for L1 instruction and L1 data caches, so 64, sorry, 640 KB total, 256 KB of L2 cache, and 20 megs of L3. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Comet Lake S actually ends up you know, being in terms of its competitiveness versus AMD. Of course, we do know that with the 3950X being a thing that exists, that has 16 cores, so obviously if Intel's only going up to 10 cores, 20 threads, they are technically losing on the pure core front, but as we have said many times, there is more to this than just pure core count. Obviously, they like to push that in their marketing, which is fair, but there's more complexity to it than that. That's that's all I mean. So it's going to be interesting to see more benchmarks, not just Geekbench, and obviously real-world performance numbers and how it fares versus AMD's um, offerings as well. So, 
Interesting stuff. But let's move on, shall we, to our first NVIDIA topic of today, which is regarding the mobile variant of the Super Cards. So we have a report which has surfaced thanks to notebookcheck.com, and of course you can find their article linked in the description below this video. And according to their report and the slide which they have helpfully shared with the internets, NVIDIA is preparing five mobility cards that are going to refresh their Turing counterparts and essentially are going to be the super mobility graphics cards for notebooks that are of course going to be going toe to toe with AMD's offerings as well. But let's talk a little more de in a little more detail, sorry should I say, about the leaked slide that Notebook Check have actually shared. So we see a few GPUs which are unfortunately just numbers, not really much else. Um, we can see the top one that has 80 watts, uh, 150 watt plus, standard uh, TGP and 8 gigabytes of GDR6 and obviously that is the case across all of them apart from the bottom two they, they all have 8 gigabytes and the bottom two have 4 gigabytes and unfortunately we can see here is the TGP as well and um, we can see 115 watts across the bottom two and then 50 watts for the last two and on the max we see 80 watts across the top three and then 35 watts across the bottom two. However we do know that one of these is going to be the RTX Super, RTX 2070 Super, sorry, 2080 Super, sorry, should I say with the first one, 2070 Super, 2060 Super, and 1650. Obviously, they are just numbers, but those are what those numbers mean. The only one that is a big question mark as to what it is, is the bottom one, the NG, sorry, N118 PP G61. So it could be something like the 1650 or something a bit touch lower than the 1650, something along those lines would make sense, but we don't know. It is a, a big old mystery at the moment. It would definitely make sense for Nvidia to do this because obviously the supercards, while they were not exactly meant with roaring applause, were received generally better than the original Turing cards just because they offer better price versus performance. So it makes sense for NVIDIA to do this on the mobile side of things as well, as of course AMD are starting to release their information as to what they're doing on the mobile side of things, both with Ryzen and with Navi as well. And also according to what Notebook Check have found, these are actually going to be the same price as their initial um, Turing variants. So essentially what this is going to mean is it's going to be cheaper, but you're going to get more performance if you're looking to get a notebook in 2020, because also they've said that this new Super Mobility series is coming in March next year. So it's going to be a while before we find out if this is accurate, but it looks pretty legit and would make sense, but of course we should take this with the usual pinch of salt and wait and see. But let's move on to our next NVIDIA topic, which is actually regarding the 2080 Ti Super. Now, we've been talking a lot about whether or not this card actually exists, and it was kind of like, meh, for a bit, and now it's kind of raised its head again. And we now have a tweet, thanks to kapiti 7 kimi I hope I pronounced that anywhere near correctly. And um, basically what they have said is that allegedly we're going to be getting a 2080 Ti Super. And they even went on to say that, well, they know some specs as well. Apparently the 2080 Ti Super is going to have 4608 cores and 16 GBPS of GDDR6 memory. Now unfortunately they didn't have any information for us on the actual clock speed, but it would make sense for it to be around 1700 MHz. But that raises a big old question mark because that's the clock speed of the Titan RTX. And would Nvidia do that to the Titan? Because think about it, you've got the 28i Super and you've got the Titan. Obviously the Titan has higher memory capacity as well, but if the TIE has the same clock speed as it, that's literally the only advantage it has. So while that memory is important for you know, prosumer workloads, that sort of thing, you would, you might be tempted just to be like, do you know what, I can make do with the less memory and just get a 2080i Super for significantly cheaper. That's what raises a bit of a question mark over these specs, but unfortunately, it's pure speculation. While this tweet, sorry, the person behind this tweet, sorry, should I say, is very reliable, has previously leaked information for the Super and GeForce GTX 16 series, and they have been accurate there as well, which leads me to believe this is probably true. I just have a question. Would 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 they do this in terms of NVIDIA, the clock speed? I mean, not, in not, not the 2080 Ti existing. It looks like that's probably going to be the case. 
It's going to be curious to see what they do in terms of the clock speed, but unfortunately we're going to have to wait and see for a reveal to have that question answered. The biggest question, of course, is going to be the price. Now, this is definitely going to be a question that NVIDIA needs to answer as correctly as they can, because price has been the one of the main criticisms of the Turing architecture. It was just very expensive for what it is. Not that it didn't bring improvements, because it did, but still, ouch, on the old wallet. So will they do like they've done with the other supercards and do it at the same sort of price as the originals, but obviously with the improved performance and then cut the price in the original? Possibly, but again, we'll have to wait and see. But speaking of prices, we actually have an interesting report regarding the PlayStation 5 to finish things off. So this once again is a rumour in giant golden flaming letters as we have a tweet from a user by the name of PS Erebus and they have tweeted several leaks about the PS5, and, well, they have said that they apparently are privy to the release date and also the price of the console. So, given that they have not cited any sources for this, I would take it with a massive pinch of salt. Now, the price and release date that they have said makes sense, with everything we know from what Sony have said, and everything that just makes sense, you know, common sense and all that. But, just keep in mind, so what did they actually say? Well, as you can see, they have said that we're going to be seeing the console on November the 20th, 2020, at a recommended price of $499. Now obviously, we already know that the console is due out late 2020, and November makes perfect sense. This is around the release date of the PS4, just a few days after it. The price is about what we've heard, to be honest. but does strike me at a little on the low side because, well, the specs of the PS5 are a beast. I have said that $500 is probably the absolute lowest that Sony can go, and even then it might be a touch low, but they might be willing to take that loss at first if it's going to get cheaper to produce later on, and obviously if it does really well, they're going to make that money back in the long term. As I said before, every console at launch is not going to be making money. It is making a loss at first. It's just how it, it works with each new console generation. So I suppose you could argue, look, Sony are going to be willing to take the, the hit for the long-term goal of being the king of the next generation, like the PS4 has been the king of the current generation. That would make sense. Maybe it's too low? I don't know. But to be honest, I would not be surprised if this tweet is roughly accurate, even if it's not exactly November the 20th, and even if it's not exactly $499, I would not be surprised if they are roughly in the fairly close vicinity to what it's actually going to be. But let me know your thoughts on everything discussed in this video, especially the PS5. How legit do you think that is? Do you agree? Is that the price we're going to see for this console? Let me know. Also guys, as I've tweeted, the voting is open for the Game Awards. I'm not associated with the Gaming Awards, not getting paid to say this. I just think that cool games need some recognition and you can go vote, because I have. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, that's me done. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you soon. Bye bye.